What is up everybody, Ducky, and today I'm going to be talking about speaker impedance, what impedance is, why it matters, and how to wire speakers and subwoofers up correctly in order to keep amps safe. So first off, what is impedance? Well, impedance is reactive resistance. It's kind of like resistance, but it changes depending on the frequency you put into it. It ends up looking like this curve right here, and this is pretty common for all speakers. We've got this peak right here, which is the Q curve of the speaker. This happens right around the resonance of the driver. This right here, where it's quite low for the wide portion of it, is called the linear region. And right here we've got the inductance, which is when the coil inside the, the voice coil of the speaker starts to act like its own crossover. You can see it all happens above this DC resistance right here. For a ported or fourth order bandpass enclosure, you can start to see something more like this, where this point at the bottom here is the tuning of the port. But other than that, the rest of it remains the same. Now when trying to determine the impedance of a speaker, usually, say, a 3.7 ohm speaker, or maybe even a 3.4 ohm speaker, something more down here, will be called a 4 ohm speaker, a 4 ohm impedance speaker. And that's because of these points right here, which act like a higher resistance than the speaker actually is. And for this, just a bit under 4 ohm speaker, you can actually round up to 6 ohms and call it a 6 ohm speaker. Because if you're playing pink noise into it, which kind of simulates music, you can see that the average is about 6 ohms. So an amplifier outputting into 6 ohms should find this just fine. For specific tasks though, for example, an amplifier which might play a minimum of 16 ohms, such as a headphone amplifier even, you can even run a speaker off a headphone amplifier as long as you only play the frequency right at the top of this peak here. So here's some really useful equations for trying to work out the stuff I'm going to be talking about in this video. Now, power equals volts times current. Volts equals current times resistance. Power equals current times resistance times current, which is the same as current squared times resistance. And volts times current, which is the same as power, equals current squared times resistance. All these are really useful. So what if you've got an amplifier rated at 4 ohms? What happens if you put too little or too many ohms into it? So you can see right here, 4 ohms is pretty ideal. It's green on this spectrum. 6 ohms is cool and efficient. The amplifier is finding it quite nice to run this speaker. And by the time you get to 8 ohms, you're actually, you've cut your power in half. As going back to this equation right here, if volts remain to the same and resistance goes up, current goes down. And because volts is the same and current goes down, power goes down. So at this point right here, you might be tempted to turn up the amplifier a bit more than you should. And you can potentially put what's known as a clipped signal into your speaker, which is when the amplifier runs out of voltage and it chops off the top of the wave. Now this is actually dangerous for speakers as if you clip it too much, a lot more current can go through the speaker than it's possibly designed to handle or is expecting and you can potentially damage speakers. But you can see when we go below it starts to be worse on the amplifier. At 3 ohms, although the amplifier usually, although a 4 ohm amp can usually run 3 ohms, uh, it's often hotter, less efficient. And at 2 ohms, which is half of its rated impedance, you can see it's much hotter. You start to run into current limitations, so instead of voltage limitations up here, uh, there's only so much current the transistors can handle before they get too hot. And this can also cause instability. The amp can cut out and you could even pop fuses and things like that. And at 1 ohm, you're very likely to trigger protection, bear temperature, fusing. And if you don't trigger anything like that and still turn it up, then you can easily cause overheating or even blow up the amplifier. So why is running the amp below its rate impedance so dangerous? As I mentioned before, volts equals amps times resistance, which can be rewritten as amps equals voltage divided by resistance. Amplifiers have a bit of resistance in them themselves. So when you connect a speaker to it, the total resistance of the system actually looks like this. Here's a big resistance from the speaker and the amplifier's got its own small resistance. So what happens is if you've got, remembering those equations before, a 10,000 watt amplifier rated at 1 ohm, which is half common, and it's got an output impedance, this one right here, of 0 0.1 ohm. The total voltage of the system, in order for this to see 100 volts, 
needs to be 110 volts. So this sees 10 volts. And 10 volts through a 0 0.1 ohm resistor is 100 amps. So you've got 100 amps flowing through this system, which makes sense because 100 volts times 100 amps is 10,000 watts. And that extra 1,000 watts from the 110 volts is turned into heat within the amplifier. So this is around about a 90% efficient amplifier, but you can still see a ton of heat being generated in this. I wouldn't suggest microwaving an amplifier. But what happens if we start to run a much lower impedance than we should? For example, a quarter ohm load. Now this is really common for people that try to get the most out of their amplifiers for SPL, where they only turn it on for a second and turn it back off again. Now usually they do the thing that I showed before, which is they take the peak impedance in order to make it seem like a 1 ohm load to the amplifier when it is in fact a 0 0.25 ohm load. But if you put 0 0.25 ohms onto an amplifier constantly, uh, just say we've still got 110 volts that I mentioned before, that means 314 amps is flowing through the circuit because power equals current squared times resistance. The power going being created within the amplifier is 10,000 watts. So it's 10 times more heat than it's designed to handle. But because of the thing in electronics called V-drip, which is what happens when your voltage goes down when you crank it, uh, it's probably more like 3,000 watts of heat, but still tons more heat than the amp can handle. So once again, why is this dangerous? Essentially, the way a transistor works is it has a small signal which tells it to turn on and off to create the sine wave. So what happens, as it gets hotter, the transistor becomes more sensitive. So with a small signal being put into it, it allows more current to flow through it. And what can happen is as it gets hotter and hotter and allows more and more current to flow, which makes it go hotter again because more current means it's getting hotter through a resistor, uh, it can go into a thing called thermal runaway, which is essentially where it stays on and current flows through it freely and it gets really hot and it burns itself. So basically pops. And this can damage not just transistors, which are easily replaceable usually because they're the most likely things to pop, but other components can even burn out traces on the board, which means essentially at that point you need to get a new amplifier. This can also be helped by hooking up external fans and making sure amps get plenty of ventilation, as this can happen within tolerance of the amplifier if you don't give it enough cooling. Now something else I'll talk about just quickly is working out the current and voltage an amplifier puts out as this is pretty useful for impedance type stuff which is as I mentioned before power equals current squared times resistance resistance is 1 ohm so it's just times 1 so you can ignore it so power equals current squared if you take the square root of both sides you end up with square root of power equals current and remember that square root cancels out with the square here so the square root of 10,000 equals 100 amps and once again, power equals current times voltage. So you can work out that 100 amps times 100 volts equals 10,000 watts. So this amp outputs 100 volts at 100 amps. Now for working out what a 4 ohm amplifier, for example, does, which is like what I've got in my car, 500 watts at 4 ohms, power equals current squared times resistance. But since it isn't 1 ohm, we have to factor it in. So the first thing we do is we divide both sides by resistance. So power divided by resistance equals current squared times resistance divided by resistance. These two resistances cancel out, so you end up with power divided by resistance equals current squared. And once again, square root both sides, the whole of both sides. So you end up with power over resistance, the square root of that equals current. So square root 500 divided by 4 equals 11.2 amps. And current times resistance equals voltage, so 11.2 amps times 4 ohms equals 44.8 volts. And if we multiply 11.2 by 44.8, we end up with 502 watts, which is just right. Now something else I'll talk about is a lot of amps have this feature called bridging, which is essentially where you link two channels together and it becomes a single mono output. Now this is really good for getting a lot of voltage out of an amplifier. As I mentioned, this amplifier right here, which is what I've got in my car, is actually a two-channel amplifier bridged. Usually the amplifiers will be rated at more like 1 ohm, maybe 1,000 watts, and to get the equivalent voltage of that previous amplifier, you'd need a 2,000 watt amplifier, but it's just 500. So, And that's because of bridging to get the voltage higher so the current goes down. So bridging amplifiers is great for running high impedance speakers in cars, 
so speakers for hi-fi i've seen a few cases where people put really high-end hi-fi speakers into a car and they sound fantastic so this is something people will actually want to do so what happens is when you get your two channels and you link them together by bridging correctly don't just link two channels together that's dangerous but when you do it properly or when you do it the way that the manual or amplifier says you can do it you get double the voltage so what you can do with this is now you can run twice the impedance and you can get double the amount of power into that same impedance so here's an example a two times 100 watt amp at 4 ohms can run one times 200 watt at 8 ohms when bridged if it supports 2 ohms then you can get up to 400 watts at 4 ohms but if it doesn't support 2 ohms wiring it at 4 ohms bridged is below its rated impedance as i mentioned before often though an amplifier will do 2 times 100 watt at 4 ohms and maybe 2 times 150 watts at 2 ohms so it'll do 200 watts at 8 ohms but it'll only do 300 watts at 4 ohms so it's not exactly the doubling that you see right here Another thing some amplifiers have, some monoblock amplifiers have, is a feature to master slave them or strap them together, as it's colloquially called, which is where you essentially bridge two amplifiers together to get a very high voltage. So, for example, if you get two 10,000 watt amplifiers and at one ohm and bridge them together, you'll get 20,000 watts into two ohms, which is the equivalent voltage of 40,000 watts into 1 ohm. So this is really good for when you need a ton of voltage to run high power, high impedance speakers. And now onto the main event, how to wire up multiple subwoofers correctly. As you can see, we've got a pretty typical sub right here. It's a reasonably good sub. It's got dual voice coil, as you can see right here. Red is the positive lead and black is the negative lead. Now one way of wiring this up is similar to what I've got in my car, which is running one amplifier per voice call and this is one of the original things that were done in speakers which is speaker power handling went up faster than car amplifier power handling so they kept adding more voice calls two voice calls or four voice calls so you could run four 250 watt amplifiers into a single 1000 watt sub and this is how they did it right here which is they took the positive output of the amp into the positive of the speaker negative into the negative so both amps were pushing the cone forward and pulling back at the same time they were in phase if you wire one amp backwards by accident bad things can happen sub can get super hot sub can burn out no problem and this would definitely break the sub and could even burn out an amplifier if a short happens when wires go flying within the coil but these days usually it's for something else it's so you can choose your own impedance so here we have an example of a parallel wired subwoofer. We got the same one, it's two ohms per coil, just like this one here was two ohms, 1000 watts per coil to get 2000 watts total. Except now we've got a 2000 watt one ohm amplifier doing the full 2000 watts by itself. And the way we do it is by connecting positive to positive of the speaker to the positive of the amplifier. So these are linked in parallel, as in there's two equal ways that the current can go through this speaker. So what that means is because there's two restrictive paths, the total is only half as restrictive. So even though each coil is two ohms, you end up with a one ohm impedance. You can also verify this with the multimeter. When you wire it in parallel, put the ohm meter on it, you'll see that it will be half of each coil by itself. And once again, all positives need to be linked and all negatives need to be linked. Otherwise, you could wire it out of phase and once again, burn out the speaker. Here we have a series configuration. So now we've got a 2000 watt 4 ohm rated amplifier and we've got the same dual 2 ohm speaker. So what happens is the electron flow comes out of here, in here, goes through the first coil, comes out of it, goes around, back into the, from negative to positive, because remember it needs to feed into positive and out through the negative so it comes around here goes through the next coil which is also two ohms so it's got twice as much restriction now which is four ohms total and back out of course it's ac so it goes back and forth but you get the idea so this configuration here is getting the speaker to four ohms 
So as you can see, for two two ohm voice calls in series, it's two times two, which is four ohms. And for two two ohm coils in parallel, it's two divided by two, which is one ohm. So putting things in parallel decreases the impedance and putting things in series increases the impedance. Something else to note about this example is usually amps are rated for one ohms. So that dual two ohm speaker would usually be wired up to one ohm. In order to get enough voltage required to put enough power into this four ohm speaker, you'd need an 8,000 watt amp, which is rated at one ohm. This is far more common than a 2,000 watt at four ohm rated amplifier. So what if you want to wire a bunch of subs together? That was just an example four, but what if you actually want to wire a bunch together? Well, it's very crucial each sub needs to have the same amount of power going through it, and it needs to have it all going in the right order, as in, as you can see right here, all of the positives are connected to the positive, all the negatives are connected to the negative, and when it comes out through the negative, it feeds back into a positive, so it's all flowing in the right direction. Also, you can see here, I've got a bunch of groups of speakers. So each group is in series, which increases the impedance, and all these groups together are in parallel, which decreases the impedance, which leaves us back at a good impedance that the amp's happy with. So here's a really handy thing. When wiring up multiple subs, for every coil in series, the resistance is impedance per coil times number of coils. And for every coil in parallel, the resistance is impedance per coil divided by number of coils. Also, if you've got a bunch of coils in series just like this for a parallel configuration, once you've added them up with this one right here, you can then put this total number into this equation right here. So instead of impedance per coil, it would be impedance per set of coils divided by a number of sets of coils. So here's an example. If you've got four 2000 watt dual two ohm subs running off a single 8000 watt at one ohm amplifier each sub can be run in series to get to raise it up to four ohms remember it's two times two which is four ohms and then all put in parallel which is this right here which is four sets of four ohms which is one set of four ohms divided by four speakers which is four over four tend up back at 1 ohm. Another thing you can do is have two sets of two speakers in parallel tend up at the 1 ohm as well. The crucial thing is having the same amount of voltage go through each speaker so you've got the same amount of current going through each speaker and making sure it's going in the right direction as in the positive of the amp goes to the positive of the speaker and when wiring up like this the positive sorry the negative of one goes into the positive of the next. This is how they need to be connected to run in series. But what about if you've got this example right here? Four 2000 watt dual four ohm subs running off a single 8000 watt one ohm amplifier. Well, due to this con configuration, it's actually impossible to wire it to one ohm. You can only wire it to a half an ohm or two ohms. So now you've got to look for a different option of amplifier. What you could do is you could chop the sets in half to have two sets of one ohms, which is four coils in parallel, four of these four ohm coils in parallel. So two subs completely in parallel, running off a thousand watt amp per set. So two amps, two sets, 8,000 watts total, or have an 8,000 watt at two ohm amp, though these aren't very common as usually high power amps are rated at one ohm, as I mentioned before. Although there are some Brazilian companies which make amps which are rated for a higher impedance, say 8,000 watts to 2 ohms. So yeah, that pretty well covers it. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll answer them as long as they're not too silly. Oh no, no, no questions, too silly. But if you enjoyed and want to learn more, hit subscribe as I'll upload more videos. I might even put up a more basic version of working out impedance and that in another video. But yeah, any suggestions for improve, improvements of the video it's still feel free to leave it I'm still growing so but thanks for watching and i really hope you learned something see ya